Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 171 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck, and if you have a staff of two or more, and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off, depending on how many people you got. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. On the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about a lecture he did that was posted on bodybybyboyleonline.com called Start With Why, based off of the book by Simon Sinek of the same name. And uh, basically, Coach Boyle talks about all the whys in his programming. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Aaron McGurr joins us to talk about the education coming up at the Perform Better Functional Training Institute. Lots coming up in September. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about making the transition from big gym employee to going out on your own. For the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach segment, I have Robert Dose from Medios. Coach Dose, he's on to talk about all things program design, including problems he sees, movement categories, his warm-up philosophy, two, three, and four-day programs, periodization, as well as his new DVD and manual, Complete program design. That and much more coming up from Coach Dose in a little while. For the Art of Coaching with Exos, Stefan Underwood is on to talk about a three-part segment about fostering a coach-athlete relationship. The first segment is on motivation through education. And for the Functional Movement System segment, Brett Jones is back to talk about continuing education. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Bug. Coach, how you doing? I am doing great, Anthony. It's, once again, a beautiful day in lovely Massachusetts. It's gorgeous here, too. But the real question is, did you get your computer fixed? Um, you know, I don't think I really did. It's working better, but I'm still having some some struggles with the spinning wheel of death. So uh I, when that starts to happen, that's when I start thinking it may be time for a new computer. So that's the that's the conspiracy. Like every two years, yeah, every two years I go in and <laughs> get another one. Apple, they're doing it. You know, they kind of make your. Uh, it's that planned obsolescence. They make your computer obsolete after like two years in the phones and all that stuff. So, you see, and then what do we say? I think I'm just going to buy a new one. It's a good plan. Brilliant. Good brilliant model. Um, <laughs> Coach, let's start with. Um, and we'll probably have a long discussion on this because I got a couple things. We'll go back and forth. You do on Body by Boyle online. You just posted a um, uh, one of your in services, and just to clarify, the different some of the different things with Body by Boyle online and Shrinkcoach.com for anybody that doesn't know, you guys post a lot more of your in services and your staff meetings and there's a lot of a lot of video content on there as well as uh, lots of the programs that you do so just so everybody kind of has a little bit of a clarification there's no real interaction there right there's no forum obviously right there's no forum no it's really just and it's more I would view it more as as an internal look at our business as opposed to mm. and obviously there is a lot of education there but I think it's very specifically geared towards Mike Boyle's strength and conditioning. So yeah. not that that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's good stuff. Kind of the way that it is. Um, and you posted a lecture of you, uh, start with the why, a uh, book by Simon Sinek, and, and you basically, uh, and we've talked about it here, um, about uh, about the book and about that concept. Uh just give us a quick overview, and we'll kind of start from there. We'll go with some questions of like about this lecture and what you, what you were talking about. Well, I think I, one of the things I realized as I was reading the book is that I probably need to do a better job explaining why we do what we do. I think I do a really good job explaining how we do what we do, or sort of the, the how and the what. This is what we do. This is foam rolling. This is stretching. This is split squat. This and lots of video and showing 
hey, this works really good. But I don't know, or I, I guess I do know, and I start to think sometimes that people don't understand the thought process. And I get that even because I realize my own staff, people who are working for us, who've done internships with us, who sometimes been with us for multiple years, don't really understand why we're doing what we're doing. And so after reading the book, I said, this is a really good way to kind of reframe a lot of the things that we've talked about a bunch in terms of we've talked about stretching and we've talked about foam rolling and we've talked about unilateral training, but maybe not an in-depth look at the why. And let's just, I mean, Simon, in the book, he talks about, he has like a, a big circle with two circles inside of it. And the inner circle is the why, the core. And then out, outside of that is the how, and then there's the what. And, you know, you made a good point. We're starting way too much with the what. Can you just kind of expand on that? Yeah, I think we start with what. We're always arguing about what exercises. Is this a good finisher? Should I do ropes? What about TRX? Instead of looking at all of those things, and we've talked about this. I guess it's just a different way to talk about the same thing over again. We're still trying to get people to understand that, yeah, you, you can – you can have a whole toolbox full of tools, but what are you going to build and why are you build it? And that'll give you a much better sense of where you're going with this whole project than you would just kind of running around and talking to everybody about your tools. You know, I got a new sawzall and I got a you know really cool new power screwdriver. And and I think we're very fascinated with the tool part, the the you know the what we're going to do, and even to some degree the how are we going to do it? Are we going to we're going to do it this way. We spend a lot of time talking about split squat. Why are we, are we forward leaning? Are we on our heel? Are we, what, and again, that's, that's the how to our what. But I think we need to keep dialing back to the why. Why are we doing unilateral training? And I think that's where people, I think there are certain people who really deeply understand what we're doing and understand why we're doing it. And then I think there's a lot of other people who kind of think, well, these guys are really smart and they've got a really good system, so I'm going to do what they're doing. So, as I did in that talk, and actually that's going to be the basis for my uh, talk. We're going to do a perform better talk on uh, up at their um, their training center in December, and it may be functional strength coach six. I haven't decided yet whether or not we'll film it, whether we'll sell it, but it will be the beginning of it. Will again be that start with why concept. Okay, why are we doing it? And then I may do Anthony what you've been trying to get me to do forever which is really going to the program design part because I did it the other day. We had some uh, students in from Taiwan and we started just sort of getting on the, being on the whiteboard and writing up, okay, phases. Why, why are we doing what we're doing? Why is phase one, phase one? What, what happens in phase one? And I realized that a, a videoed whiteboard session might not necessarily be a bad complement to this whole FSC series in terms of, rather than just popping a slide up there and then trying to explain the slide and get to the next slide. I actually ended up, I did such a, the whiteboard stuff came out so good, I took a picture of it and put it in my computer so that I could make sure I could reproduce my thought process because it's really interesting how the the questions that you get, particularly from uh, sort of these, I would say these Taiwanese students were book educated end users. So they'd read a lot. They understood about FMS and they understood about periodization and then it was sort of explaining, well, again, why are we doing what we're doing? Why does our program look the way that it does? So uh, it's going to be, it'll be, I think it'll be a really cool seminar, to be honest. Not that I was trying to get to that seminar, but somehow I yeah. tangented, uh, tangented over there instead of work. <laughs> well, it's all part of the process, of right? It's all part of the process yeah. of, of the why. But what if, what if really... I mean, I, I've actually said that to people. I've said to younger strength coaches, you know, if you're going to put something in, as long as you have a why, even if it's wrong, honestly, I mean, because I, I always loved Thomas Myers. Uh, first time I saw him, really the first time and one of the only times, but he said 50% of what I'm about to tell you is wrong. I just don't know which 50% it is, right? So... I mean, we don't know what we don't know sometimes. I mean, there's a lot. Like, for example, let's go. You, you start out with foam rolling. You're a big proponent of foam rolling. 
and there's a lot of argument about what foam rolling really does, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, lengthening the tissue or, or whether it's kind of creating, uh, you know, waking up some proprioceptors, right? Whatever. Um, that's not what, what really we're trying to get after right now. But, you know, your why could be wrong right now for the foam rolling. Oh, so, absolutely. All the, I think all the whys could be wrong. The why for foam rolling could be wrong. The why for stretching could be wrong. Everything. And I think it's sort of, we always talk about reserving the right to change our mind and reserving the right to, to get more education and to make better decisions. And I think a lot of times, I think that's, I guess, what we're trying to do with people is get this idea of this is why we're doing what we're doing right now. And why well, I went into breathing later on. This is why we're doing breathing. And, and there's some science that supports why we're doing breathing. Yet, a year ago or two years ago, we weren't in any breathing exercises at all. So I think, and I always say that to me is the cool part of this profession, is that even you look at somebody like me and you say, okay, I'm 30 whatever years into this thing, and I guess relatively speaking, I'm at the top of the field, yet I'm very consistently learning new information all the time, every year, looking at stuff and saying, okay, I, the way that we did that sort of the the how to that what wasn't very good. And I realized now the how to that what wasn't very good. And then I go back to the why and say, okay, well, why are we doing that in the first place? And is there a, a way that we can do it better? And I think that's the, the game. And the interesting thing is you have this constant, never-ending battle. Yeah, and I think another thing is, you know, you, you've been doing it for 30 years, but in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing. 30 years, I mean, the, I'm, that's a lot in the industry, obviously, but this is still a new industry. Um, it's almost like technology. Like, so much has changed over the last 10 years. More has changed in the last 10 years than the previous 100, right? So I think, you know, because it's so new, I mean, I always think, wow, people ask me about the golf, you know, golf fitness business, and I I always say, you know, I feel like I've been in it forever and sometimes I, I want to give up on some of these golf pros um, because I think what you see out in the real golf world or, you know, what we see on television with the pros out there. Now, all these guys are in great shape. They all work out. They all have trainers. Uh, LPGA, PGA, everybody. The best golfers have trainers. But it's still, it's still, you still have to convince people that, it might be a good idea to do some training if you want to get a little more serious about golf, if you want to maybe go out there and play. Like I always say, one of my clients went away. He played uh, Whistling Straits Thursday and Friday, came back, played Bout the Straw on Saturday, and then Ridgewood on Sunday. And he said the coolest thing was I didn't. I had no pain, no pain, no back pain, no problems. I was traveling. I was playing. That's the greatest thing for me to hear. So it's not only getting better, but it's also, you know, feeling better. But the bottom line is, it's all new. I've been doing this. I went to the World Golf Fitness Summit in 2006. I'm like, oh man, I've been, I've been doing, working with golfers for over 10 years. But at the same time, it's still brand new. So I think that right now we're still learning so much in the industry. Oh, I don't think there's any question. And that's where you start thinking. Even if you said, you go back to, okay, golf fitness, why? And you probably hit on one of the big whys of golf fitness, injury prevention. These guys love golf. They're obsessive about golf. If you can do a good job with your golf fitness, then you can help them to play more golf and to play more golf better, healthier. But when I looked, you know, someone said to me, why the thing, the, the reason I got into it initially. And, and as you know, I kind of came in through the back door of the golf fitness world was because I had friends who trained with me who golfed who did our program and were amazed at how much further they could hit the ball. And that sort of led me to, to James Driscoll and Brad Saxon and these tour guys that I work with, but it was the recreational golfer who all of a sudden was out on the golf course, crushing the ball and saying, I think it's the lifting and the medicine ball throws and the stuff that we're doing. I'm killing the ball. And then I went, Oh, look at me. I'm a golf fitness instructor. You know, I know something about how to train for golf. And, when in fact, you know, and again, it's like Jason Glass's thing. You know, I know how to train for rotational power sports. I can help somebody throw a baseball. I can help somebody 
shoot a hockey puck, and therefore I can help somebody hit a golf ball because there's a lot of similarities there in terms of the sequencing and the, the, the kinematics that's going on. And yet you, you would look at it and be like, oh, my God, no, the kinematics are so different. You know, baseball is coming off of one leg, and hockey, you know, there's a wider stance, and they're better over the trunk. And so, you know, you realize that it, there is there's sort of these simple whys, and then there's these much larger, more complex whys. And to go back, and then I'll interrupt one more time, Kevin Carr gave me the great idea when you start talking about starting with why. Why are we in the industry? What's your why? And I think we I think we started that talk with that, although I'll have to watch that talk again to see. But I remember when I was talking to Kevin about this whole idea, and I was going right to the why of why we roll, why we stretch. And he was like, no, no, we should start with why. Why are we here? Why are we doing what we're doing? And I was like, oh, wow, I, I kind of missed, you know, I, I sort of, in my in my zeal to explain why we were doing what we were doing, I completely whiffed on that part. So there's yeah. a lot of, just a cool book. Obviously, hopefully a lot of people will go out and buy Star Wars. And the one thing I'll tell you, stick with it. I didn't, the first, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 pages of the book, I was like, this book stinks. <laughs> and, and I put it down. And then, you know, I have this sort of, okay, I got to read X number of books. So I was like, I got to finish Star with Y. So I sat <laughs> That I picked it back up, and then suddenly it grabbed me and sucked me in. And then I think I said this in the podcast. I was suddenly writing notes in every blank space that there was on the book about this whole idea because I felt like some ways I was like I feel like Gladwell's writing is really redundant. Sometimes you know when you write about mm -hmm. tipping point or outliers, it's like okay, I get it. I know what a tipping point is. I understand the outliers thing. I don't have to keep reading another chapter, another another explanation of the tipping point, another explanation of outliers. I get it. And that's how I thought I was going to feel about Start With Why, but I didn't. And I kind of ripped through the rest of it. And, and then, as I said, it was inspirational enough for me to go and create a presentation based around his idea. Yeah, good stuff. Well, Coach, let's go back to it because, I mean, there is, you know, there there's a little bit of this, a little confusion maybe in the beginning of your lack. Not confusion, but um, like, for example, if I have a template – Technically, I'm starting with a what, but that's okay because I can give you a why for that template. So kind of go over, you know, somebody who might say, well, if Coach Boyle's telling me I have to start with the why, then the foam roll, maybe if somebody comes in and they're completely flexible and they meet every flexibility requirement, whatever, do they need to foam roll and stretch? So maybe I can skip that. But, you know, like, talk to us about having a template. Well, that's, I think, you know, a template, but I think I would look at it more as having a system. And then realizing that, yeah, the system is going to have exceptions in it, but it doesn't change the system. And you can't, I think, that, and that's one of the problems, I think, industry-wide, is that people spend way too much time, it kind of goes back to the 80-20 thing, we spend way too much time programming for the exception versus the rule when we should be programming for the rule. We spend way too much time programming for the 20% when we should be programming for the 80%. And that's why for me, I have people I say, I write one program and then I modify that program. So today I'm working with Hillary Knight, who's one of our best female hockey players, maybe the best player in the world. And we're modifying her program because she's having some back pain. But we're starting with the same basic template that we started with before and whether like I said whether it's rolling stretching but even yesterday we were stretching and some of the girls I'm with my daughter's team and some of the girls are really flexible I said hey if you're really flexible and your adductors and this stretch is easy for you don't push the stretch if you can't get to 90 you got to push the stretch and so I do think I even believe in stretching restoring resting length no matter what your resting length is is probably a good thing when you think about muscle tone and proprioception and a lot of that stuff and realizing that you will in fact lose no matter you may be really flexible and then you may just lose flexibility to the point where you're still above average but that might not be good for you in terms of your movement patterns your gait pattern your ability to do things so i always you know sometimes you've got to look and think i don't necessarily want to gain past a certain point but i don't want to ignore it either and say oh yeah you don't need to do that Particularly when you're not, it's one thing, and I was if you're training people, if your job, if you're a personal trainer and that's all you do is one-on-one, -on -one, then yeah, you can probably have that kind of system and say, well, this person doesn't need to stretch. 
I think everybody needs to roll. I think everybody's got density issues and everybody's going to have knots and everybody's going to have micro trauma or whatever we want to call that. But I would think that stretching is probably one of the things that's got some flexibility to it. How about that for using a redundancy? But you know what I mean in terms of yeah. some people may need to just do it very specifically for certain areas. Other people may not need to do it at all. And then I think in, when you get into power development, but it's really everything has it. Power development has it. We're going to look at power development and say, okay, what tool are we going to use? Even though we know that we want we want to develop the nervous system, for some people it may be Olympic lifting, for some people it may be swings, for some people it may be jumps. The strength training, same idea in terms of, hey, we got to load the spine and we got to not load the spine. But I still think that system or that template of what goes in what order, what comes first, what comes next. And again, going back to the why, why does rolling precede stretching? Why does stretching precede dynamic warm-up? I think that's all the stuff. And again, as you said, when you understand the why, you can choose to change the template, provided you could produce your why. Yep. If you said to me, this is why I'm going in. And it's funny, Joe Ken does that. And he does power stuff later in the workout. But he says deliberately, I do that because in football – you need to be able to produce power late in the game. You know, someone's going to have to be able to clean at the end of their workout as well as at the beginning. Now, I don't agree with that, and I never do it that way, but I appreciate the fact that Joe Ken has a why. When I look at Joe Ken's program, and if I said, I have no idea why you do that, he'd be like, here's why I do it. And whether I agree or whether I disagree is not the relevant point as much as knowing that he does, in fact, have his why. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's the, I tried to stress that to people when, you know, when they're do, doing my program or, you know, or trainers that have come in. And I said, well, you know, if you're going to change something, make sure you have a why and tell me about it. So, but, um, all right, well, see, I knew it. I knew we were going to spend all 20 minutes on. Yeah, we got one question. Start with the why. So, <laughs> but, uh, Coach, thanks so much and uh, have a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon. I am going to have a great weekend. You do too, all right? All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better, and I am about to ask Aaron McGurr a couple of questions. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm um, the expert today. <laughs> you are the expert. Um, what do we – well, let's just mention it. We have, we've been talking a lot about it, but let's mention it. What's your sale, Aaron? <laughs> Our sale today is – the Perform Better end of summer sale. Um, I know this has been going on for a little while, but we still have another four weeks of it, which is crazy. Um, but we have all of our, most of our top products on sale up to 40% off again until the end of September. So we have everything from the assault bikes, which I am actually sitting on right now. Um, our drive sled two stability balls, a bunch of different med balls, our elite balls, jam balls, even Dynamax, and then some other things, ultimate sandbags. We have weight vests, plyo boxes, TRXs, foam rollers, super bands, mini bands. Pretty much anything you need to get a great workout is on sale, and now would be the time to get it. And we are also honoring free shipping on orders on most of those items over $50. So double dipping, like I always say. All right. Very cool. Um, we've certainly given that enough airtime, plenty of airtime. It's been going on for a while. And we gotta, we'll got we keep mentioning it till the end. But I uh, wanted to talk e, about the Perform Better Functional Training Institute because we've been kind of – we haven't really talked a lot about it because of uh, the uh, the summits um, have been going on all summer. And, you know, between the one days and the summits, now you guys got uh, a lot of education coming up starting on September 12th. So uh, at your home in West Warwick, Rhode Island, the Perform Better Functional Training Institute. Give us a rundown of what's coming up. Um, well, the rundown, and it's crazy. I was just looking at the schedule the other day, and I can't even believe we have four seminars coming up in, the, like you said, the next month. Um, so starting on Saturday, September 12th, we have Frank Nash, who's the owner of Frank Nash Training Systems in Massachusetts. He's going to be doing a seminar, Building Your Social Media Brand. It's something that I'm looking forward to because we haven't really done anything. We've done some business things in the past, but we've never really gone into specific, um, you know, branding. So this is this is a big step for us. But 
Frank's going to be talking about social media success and really how, how to build your social media tribe, um, getting your followers to kind of turn into clients and really just driving revenue and how you can generate revenue and, you know, things like that from, from social media, which if anyone has seen Frank's posts, I know I'm friends with him on Instagram and Facebook. He does an amazing job and just the way he can, um, you know, build his own company like that. I'm interested to hear what he has to say. So that's the first one coming up again on September 12th. The following week, we have Michelle Dalcourt coming in, and he's going to be doing essential programming methods for movement performance. He is going to be talking about the four-quadrant model of program design. So his is going to be a lecture and hands-on. Um, like I said, he's going to be going over different training principles and it's exciting that he's coming in. We've never had anyone actually come in and use the Vipers, so that's going to be another first for us. But I know he's going to be doing a lot of exercise design, um, movement progressions and regressions, different movement cues, and then, like I said, using the Viper, different shifting, and kind of showing how to implement that into programs and different program design things. So, again, another thing I'm looking forward to. Following that seminar in Rhode Island. We're going to be having Josh Hankin come in. He's going to be doing his dynamic variable resistance training seminar, and that's going to be on Saturday, September 26th. He's going to be doing everything from how to develop the hip and hinge, beyond the deadlift, pressing overhead, developing the squat, um, different stepping and lunging patterns, again, using the ultimate sandbag and some other different tools and showing as well how to incorporate that into program design. So it's good. We're really touching base with a lot of program design. So um, we have that coming up. And the last one of the month is actually a two-day seminar. It's going to be Lee Burton. We have Lee coming in, and he's going to be doing an FMS Level 1 and Level 2 combined, which We've done the one for many years in the past. We started doing the twos every now and then sporadically, but this is the first time that just for the one weekend, it's going to be um, Friday, October 2nd, and Saturday, October 3rd, where they are combining it. So the first day, he's going to be going over just the philosophy, background of the functional movement screen, going over the scoring, the testing, um, everything you would learn on how to do the tests. And then on uh, October 3rd, we're going to be, not we, but Lee is going to be covering exercise progressions, um, corrective exercise, kind of going over all that stuff and covering what he talks about in level two. So excited that we're finally going to get that combined. Um, I've never seen them put together, so that should be interesting. And also October 2nd, um, when he's starting that seminar, that's my birthday. So nice. whoever comes to that... I'm totally going to take them out and we're going to party just for my birthday. So that's motivation cool. in itself just to show up. Nice. So that's a great lineup. I think if, you know, if you haven't heard of Frank Nash, um, he a great guy. First of all, I had him on train coach TV before he had his new place, but, uh, does a great job with all that stuff. And then, uh, Michelle Dalcourt is such a total sleeper. I mean, doesn't make a lot of waves. His lectures and, and hands-ons are amazing. Same thing with Josh Hank. And I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, for his DVRT, a lot of people just think of, okay, it's going to be sandbags. And it's not that. It's a whole system. It's it's about way more than that. So very cool. And like you said, Lee Burton, the man himself doing one and two is kind of cool. And I think that's the way those things should be taught anyway. Uh, you know, there's a lot of information out there. Go prepared for one, and then uh, it's very interesting what they do in uh, in level two. So uh, very cool. The Perform Better Functional Training Institute. Great stuff coming up. You can check that out at performbetter.com. So, E, thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. This is Alan Cosgrove from resultsfitnessuniversity.com, and this is the Strength Coach Podcast Business of Fitness segment everybody's favorite part of the podcast every single time. I know it is. All right. This lesson is a question that we got last week. And it said, I'm frustrated with the gym I work at and I would like to go on my own. How do I make that transition? This is actually quite a common one and it's, uh, it's often um, it, the sort of paralyzing part for a lot of people is they, they're working at a, a big gym or they're working somewhere where they're unhappy and they want to go on their own, but they really don't know the first step. So, and, and wondering, should they jump? Like, and that's something that's always hard for me to answer. So 
the first thing to do, the first thing that, that we did actually was we listed all our frustrations, right? So everything that you, you're unhappy with at the place you're at, this is good because it gets it out of your head and stops it being emotional and starts making it, you know, some facts like I'm unhappy with this. Is there a solution to that? And what we found is when we'd written down all our frustrations, about 80% of the frustrations were related to the management and the facility that we were at. So that was that could be solved in one fell swoop by just moving to another facility, which was our own. So the first thing is really get everything out of your head and onto paper. So Because maybe you know there's a lot of upside to being where you're at too, and you're just seeing some of the negative stuff right now. But that's how you do it. That you get it all out of your head and put it on paper. The second thing is what we did is we hired a business coach. That's an understood program design. I understood exercise coaching. I didn't understand marketing. I didn't understand communicating, staffing. I really didn't understand numbers too well. And, you know, how, how could I bill? And, you know, when looking back, you see the cut that you're working at a big club and they took a cut of every training session. And when you're on your own, you realize why. Because there's a lot of extra bills that go in when you're running a facility. So we hired a business coach to really help us see the stuff that we weren't able to see ourselves. And then it was just really planning and, and preparing is that we needed, we figured out what the rent was going to cost. What percentage of, how many training sessions would I need to do to cover that rent? How much money did I need to make? How much money did Rachel need to make so we could live? How many clients does that translate to? Right? I mean, like I said, I knew how many pieces of equipment I wanted to get and how many functional movement screen kits, but I sort of lost on, on everything else and how to collect money. And there's a saying uh, that I think when you're in college, you have to pay attention. And when you're in business, you have to get paid attention too, right? You have to get the, the marketing uh, side of things in place. So that was really, that was really our sort of our hesitation is I knew the training would be fine. It was the other stuff. And then I just have this this sort of, my belief system is to not waste any time. We hired a coach to help us with it and it, that worked out great, as you can see now. And lastly, at some point, you've just got to jump. The, the phrase is jump and the net will appear. Everyone wants this smooth, easy transition where you're working 40 hours a week at, your, at the other gym and then you open yours two hours a week and cut back to 38 hours there and then four hours a week and cut back to 36, That's it's just not going to happen. At some part, you, you are going to have to take massive fast action and, and move into your place. So that's the, that's the part where, hey, if, you've, if you know you're frustrated where you're at and these can be solved and you've gotten some good advice on, on your numbers, your marketing, what the vision for your, your new company is going to be, then the jump part's not as stressful as it sounds. But that said, everybody uh, deserves to be happy, I believe. And if you're unhappy with where you're at, you can move on and, and create something of your own and make something that's valuable uh, to you. So that's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in to the Strength Coach Podcast. This is Alan Cosgrove from resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Please check out our new website, resultsfitnesslaunchpad.com. That is one of our events coming up in October of this year, and we'd love to see you there. Hello, this is Brett Jones. Welcome to the functional movement segment of the podcast. Uh, today, I just want to touch on something that uh, uh, kind of got brought to my mind by posts by Coach Boyle and Alan Cosgrove uh, with some issues that they were talking about within uh, continuing education. Uh, I've been traveling and teaching uh, kettlebell training since 2003, working with a wide variety of fitness professionals uh, and people of all walks of life. I've uh, been traveling and teaching FMS since 2006 and again working with a lot of different fitness professionals, clinicians and things of that nature. And one of the most common questions that, that I get, uh, the workshop is wrapped up, you know, everybody's pardon me, kind of saying their goodbyes. And somebody comes up and invariably the question is, what's next? So I've come to refer to this from a continuing education perspective as the what's next syndrome. Um, um, the, the personal trainer fitness industry um, is, um, is great in that we have access to a wide variety of 
continuing education and, and topics that we can we can learn about. Uh, but it's also bad that we have all of these topics and continuing education things that we can we can go to and learn from because the the what's next thing is is a is a powerful syndrome. And you know, for me, if you've gone through um, call it an FMS level one or level two workshops, maybe you've done the the, the combo weekend. Um, people come up and say, "What's next?" Well, you go home and you put this into practice. You screen 20, 30, 40, 50 people. You generate 20, 30, 40, 50 corrective strategies uh, using the algorithm and knowing why you're addressing certain things. Um, if the next thing is another corrective exercise or uh, screening technique, uh, it's like trying to learn two foreign languages at once. Um, you know, we we really recommend, and I think you would would see that uh, foreign languages are not taught on uh, mass, uh, where you're learning two, three uh, foreign languages at the same time. You you dive in, you learn a language. Um, if it's one of the so-called romantic languages, uh, Italian, Spanish, French, um, you usually have an easier time learning one of those other languages after you have already learned uh, one of those languages because there are some similarities. So when you're tr trying to handle three languages at once, uh, it, gets, it gets pretty complicated in the brain. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on and you ha you're going to struggle a lot more. So you know, my answer to the what's next syndrome is go practice. Uh, take like I said, from an FMS perspective, you're gonna. I want you to go home. I want you to screen 20, 30, 40, 50 people. I want you generating 20, 30, 40, 50 corrective strategies and following those strategies through. Make sure you see how all these things carry out. Um, I, I every place I've gone and I've I've lived different places. Um, I've had clients that have been with me from very early on in a location until I leave a location. Um, I recently left a position where I had people that have been with me for eight, seven, six years. Uh, so I've seen these things play out over time. And I, and I, I held myself to using the FMS um, strictly. And, and I, that deep practice and study has allowed me some mastery uh, of the concepts, the principles, the techniques. And instead of rushing from one thing to the next, I, I dove deep uh, within the system and have learned it uh, on a very deep, deep level. So, you know, I think from a continuing ed perspective, the other thing that helps with the what's next syndrome is have a plan. You know, I, I need to recertify my NSCA every two to three years. I just drew a blank and can't remember if it's two two or three, but I need to recertify every so often. So I need a certain number of continuing ed units to make that happen. So when you've finished a recertification period, look ahead. Look at the next two to three years. What are the hot topics out there that you would like to take a workshop on? Uh, what are the things that you're struggling with from a client perspective? Are you struggling from a business perspective? Then you need to go take a business workshop. If you're struggling with uh, overhead mobility, then you may need to take uh, a workshop that's focused on that. If your clients come in and they're struggling with nutrition, then you know precision nutrition and others are available to to fill that gap. Um, have a plan. Have a direction for what you want to be do, uh, doing from a continuing ed perspective, and do what you need to to maintain your certification and continuing ed units. Um, when you're on the what's next train, uh, you can run out of money and you can run out of opportunity for the next workshop because you've taken six workshops in a year. And now um, for the next continuing ed period, um, you don't want to retake workshops and so you end up you know, struggling to find continuing ed units perhaps. So – the answer to the what's next syndrome, practice, implementation, study. Uh, when you've learned something over a weekend, 
you need to go and implement it. You need to see how it works with your clients and with yourself, and and that deep practice and study will will pay off as times move forward. Uh, have a plan. Have a plan uh, so that what's next uh, makes sense. You know, look at the things that you're you need to do better as a professional and take a workshop in that. Um, don't don't just jump from one to the next to the next to the next uh, because you're just uh, in a hurry to learn everything. Um, be be happy uh, in deep practice and uh, it will pay off. So continuing education, uh, something I am very passionate about, uh, something that I've done for quite some time and uh, certainly recommend for everyone to be out there actively reading books, articles, journals, uh, learning and reading all the time, but, uh, but also have a plan and, and implement and practice. So you're the answer to the end of the next workshop you're at when the question in your head is what's next. I hope I've been able to provide a little bit of a perspective or answer on that. Um, put in the time, go into the deep practice, implement, have a plan, and uh, enjoy your continuing education. So um, have, uh, have fun out there. Uh, for more information uh, on our continuing education offerings, look at functionalmovement.com. And uh, have a great day. Hi, this is Stefan Underwood for The Art of Coaching with Exos. Last year, I was fortunate enough to sit in on a presentation in Sydney, Australia, given by Dr. Roy Sugarman. And while it was filled with phenomenal take-home points, he said one thing that really stuck out. You are only an expert with an invitation. We're going to kick off a three-part segment on how to get that invitation and, more importantly, how to keep it. Essentially, we will be discussing important points for fostering a strong coach-athlete relationship. In this first segment, we will talk about motivation through education. Coaching is teaching and vice versa. This past January, February, while running the movement portion of our NFL Combine Prep Program in Gulf Breeze, Florida, one week before the Combine, I had an intern ask me why I wasn't coaching very much during warm-up, where in previous weeks, I was coaching a movement prep session with as much focus and energy as any other component of the program. Truth be told, for the past two weeks, leading into Combine, I progressively pulled back and by the week before, my instruction was simply, you have 20 minutes to get ready to sprint. This is when the intern asked me about my lack of coaching. Now, to be clear, I was still paying very close attention to what each athlete was doing so I could make any corrections if need be. And my progression to this minimal coaching was gradual, not a sudden drop-off. The critical piece here is that a performance specialist who creates a coach dependency for the athlete is actually doing that client a disservice. The fact is, while I would be with the athletes in Indianapolis right up to and including the night before their 40s, I would not be by their sides in Lucas Oil in the moment before they ran. If they cannot reproduce the successes they had in training when they're on the biggest stage and is because I did not sufficiently educate them to the process, then as their coach, I failed them. Remember, as a coach, you're visiting the athlete where they're at. This is their journey, and as the coach, you are one piece of their team. Serving athletes in this manner is creating an athlete-centric model. This is the first step to fostering the right relationship. On day one of any program, communicate to the athlete that this is their process. It is coach-guided, but ultimately it is their career. I'll tell an athlete, you're the expert in everything you. Going back to that presentation by Dr. Sugarman last year, there are three pillars of higher performance, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. This is something that my colleague Brett Bartholomew talked about a lot with respect to how these drives affect the coaching environment. If relating these p- pillars to fostering a relationship and gaining an invitation to be a trusted expert, educating the athlete along the way is critical. It is human nature that doing a task without understanding the why will lead to a lesser performance than a person performing the same task with an understanding of the intent behind it. This is where coaching is teaching. Providing the intent behind an exercise increases the likelihood of the athlete performing it correctly, but also does a solid job of fostering a relationship in which the athlete is a large piece of the process. And to that point, this is why it is critical as a coach you understand the intent and can demonstrate that intent through a full effort demo. This leads to the coach receiving and maintaining that invitation to visit the athlete where they're at and becoming a trusted expert. In the remaining two segments, we will expand on the concept of fostering this relationship through discussion of appropriate feedback, timing, and delivery methods, 
and development of a seamlessly integrated team creating the right culture. For more information about Exos Education, please visit us at www.teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. To hear more about the art of coaching and fostering the coach athlete relationship, especially if in Europe, I'll be at Adidas headquarters in Germany, September 14th to 24th, representing the Exos Education team, teaching a phase one and phase two mentorship alongside Nico Schmidt. And I believe there are still a few slots available. We'd love to see you there. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach, and I have on Robert Dose Remedio. It's been on the podcast a couple of times, but it's been a long time. He's the former head strength and conditioning coach at College of the Canyons in Santa Clarita. He's also the 2006 NSCA Collegiate Strength Coach of the Year, Master Strength and Conditioning Coach for the CSCCA. He's also the author of Men's Health Power Training and Cardio Strength Training. Uh, both were best-selling books. That's uh, the last times that we actually had him on where to kind of, you know, go over those books. He's uh, doing a lot of consulting for Nike right now and uh, working on his 27th year in the business and uh, got a new program coming out called Complete Program Design. So I figured I would take this opportunity to talk a little bit about program design in general and about his product. Coach, thanks for coming on today. Oh, man, thanks, man. It's always a pleasure, Ant. All right. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's funny. You and I have always kind of, when we see each other, we kind of talk a lot. We always kind of break break the internet trainer's balls all the time and, uh, <laughs> you know, like always kind of get a good laugh about some of these guys out there on the internet that, uh, you know, are some of the uh, – the uh, the voices of some of this stuff. Meanwhile, they don't train anybody, and uh, and I know you've been doing a lot of. It. I looked at your lecture for this program. This is basically, uh, you know, um, one of uh, part of your, your your complete program design package was where uh, you have a, a webinar, and and I, I watched that webinar and. And, uh, you know, I know you did some searching for some, some programs, and uh, sometimes it's hard to find. But I wanted to just start out with that. Where, you know, what are some, you know, because any good product solves a problem. So what are some of the problems you're seeing with program, program design? I, I, you know, it's kind of a weird, and I don't know, if, I hope it's not a trend, but I, I, I kind of see kind of uh, people trying to get too complex. And I think sometimes people do that because – Maybe they know that solid training is not that difficult to kind of grab and, and, and run with. So sometimes I think you need a little more bells and whistles, especially on these days on the internet when you're selling stuff. So, um, you know, so it's like, hey, let's do this. And, let, you know, I'm not going to do your traditional, uh, you know, superset this way. I'm going to do it this way or I'm not going to, you know, there, there's just a lot of that. I think maybe an overthinking, um, trying to make something very more, very complex to make it seem maybe more special. That or just a misunderstanding, right? Just a misunderstanding that it is pretty simple and we can kind of set up essential movement patterns and we can plug and play that way and use exercises that you're familiar with and you're comfortable teaching rather than going, I really need to incorporate this TRX thing or this Olympic lift when you don't feel competent at teaching those. So I think that's the biggest problem I see. I also kind of, we've talked about this after the last <clears throat> Perform Better and kind of the feedback I was getting from a lot of trainers coming through and even entry-level trainers who just seemed kind of disinterested in programming, like just disinterested in the training and more interested in the, in the mental stuff, in the uh, motivation stuff, in the physical therapy kind of leaning, uh, you know, leaning towards the physical therapy kind of manipulation stuff. So to me, that, that was kind of a weird, it was a scary thing. I hope it's not a trend. I hope it's just something I just kind of observed a little bit and talked to some people about, but the programming has to, you know, that has to be your bedrock, you know, like what, how good are your programs? And then at that point, you know, how good are you at conveying that message and coaching and cueing and then motivating and all that stuff. But you got to have something of substance there, you know, that, that that's going to help your clients reach their goals or your athletes reach their goals. It's funny. Yeah. I mean, you, I, you made a great point, but I want to get back to that. But you're right about, I think I have a young trainer that was asking me about some stuff and he was saying, you know, I got to do something for my videos because this guy won't post my videos because they're not exciting enough. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. don't fall into that trap. Yeah. You know, do your thing. This is a smart kid, really passionate, loves what he's doing. Uh, the future's bright with this kid. And, but, you know, I can't blame him. 
because I think, you know, in terms of this is how he grew up. He grew up with all the social media and they're seeing all these things and people are responding to it. And I think you're right with the motivational stuff. Number one is we're seeing, you know, a few of the guys that perform better and like, you know, they're kind of outliers like Martin Rooney or Todd Durkin. I mean, those are mm-hmm. big. You have to have that personality to, 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 to be like that anyway. And those guys have a lot of experience. Um, so, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing like guys that want to either go in that direction. Cause it looks like, Oh, you know, those rooms are filled all the time and everybody's mm-hmm. having a good time. And I think you're right. The other direction is the physical therapy portion where I think people think, okay, I want to be smarter than just the strength and conditioning yeah. coach when, it, when yeah. it's, they're not really uh, making it as important as it should be, you know? Well, they want to be something perhaps that they're not. And, and I think there's some legal lines there, you know, that we're, we're, where we're trying to cross. That's a dangerous, it's a slippery slope because legally we're not supposed to do a lot of that stuff. And that's the whole thing. You know, you've heard me talk about, we've heard other people talk about like Alan and Boyle and to refer out. There's a point where you, you have a lane but it, we have a hard time staying in our own lanes, I think, a lot of times now. But I'm seeing it the other way, too. I'm seeing, you know, PT people, sports med people now start to try to talk about training. And this is what we do when we're training for strength and power. I'm like, what, when do you do that? Like, when, who are you doing it with? Like, what's, you know, what's your group? Like, where, where how did that come about? So to me, it's almost uh, there has to be that kind of mutual respect between those two. Uh, you know the sports med and then the the actual weight room, you know, strength coach or trainer. But I think the, those people blur those now. So we, we we like to go, hey, I like to, you know, I like to do this and manipulate, you know, this on this person. And the reality is, you, you shouldn't be putting hands on people if you're not if that's not your lane. You know, if I'm just if I'm a trainer, I'm not a PT or athletic trainer or something. I, I, you know, I think we got to be careful with that. And I, and I think uh, another thing is. I don't know if if Coach Boyle was kind of the first one to kind of talk to me about this was, you know, we want to switch things up because you think clients are bored or athletes are bored when really it's you that might be bored because that's what you're doing all day. And, you know, maybe it's, you know, think about that. Like for some of these people, they come in twice a week and people like, oh, you got to switch it up. You got to switch it up. I don't know about that. You know, and they're only here twice a week. That's a great point. I mean, it really is because they're twice a week and, you know, this is the but next the second time you see them it's you know i've had 1200 kids since then you know so so but that group of golfers or that group of you know track athletes you're right they haven't they're not burned out on it they're having fun with it or they're they're still thriving in it so that's a pretty good point actually i could see my i see myself doing that a lot you know just kind of thinking about oh man this is getting old right well it's getting old for you cuz you just did it for a zillion hours this week you know? <laughs> Coach, talk to us about let's let's get into it now. Let's just kind of talk about the foundation because you put, um, you know, your movements into different categories. So I mean, this is the start of that template is by understanding the categories. Talk to us how you program your your uh, or you you categorize your movement. Yeah, I think I think you know so many of us do very you know probably ninety percent will overlap. I've always said that before, you know, like we have an industry where we kind of like to fight each other and, you know, differ each other, differ from each other. But the majority of the stuff I think usually overlaps, you know, covers, it's covers each other up. But, um, you know, this goes, to, goes back to power training, which was almost 10 years ago now. And we created this template system and it's just a system where I decided, you know, what are the essential movement patterns that we should be training? Uh, and then within that movement pattern, you have all your different tools and your different you know, menu items essentially. And then, you know, I, I got to think about, you know, not stick, staying in one plane all the time with that particular movement and unilateral versus bilateral. So there's, there's other considerations within it, but in general, you've got these chunks <clears throat> or blocks of movement patterns. So for me, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, most of them are movements. One of them is, is an action, which is an explosive. So our first and foremost one is our explosive or our power exercise. And that could be any type of Olympic lift, anything basically that where we're trying to get triple or even quadruple extension, like that full blast extension. So I wouldn't put kettlebell swings in there, obviously, because we wouldn't be getting a triple extension, right? You'd be getting like that double extension, the knee and the hip. But things like like high pulls or even scoop throws of the med ball or resisted band jumps, that's somewhere you can unload. So that would be like my explosive. Then I have more or less, more or less, I guess you'd say a knee dominant, which would be any squatting, stepping, or lunging pattern. And then I have a hinging pattern, 
um, or hip dominant, which would be like your hinging stuff, your swings, your RDLs, even like your TRX shulks, things like that, things where you're maybe going to work in unison with hip extension and knee flexion. Then we got pushing and pulling, which is going to be on both planes of movement, vertical and horizontal. Um, then we have core, and the core is kind of a subdivision. They have two subdivisions. One's going to be like that pillar, anti-extension, planking, ab wheel kind of stuff. And then the other one's going to be the rotational uh, and anti-rotation stuff. So the rip trainer stuff, the med ball stuff, uh, the pal off presses, you know, the, the stuff where we're overcoming that rotation sometimes where we're actually going to physically rotate. So, I mean, that's it. I mean, that, and, and then within it, obviously, we're going to have all these different exercises or choices, but that's, that's how it's always been for us in terms of, you know, plugging in those systems or having in those moving patterns. And then now just picking, you know, cherry picking what you want out of there and plugging them into the workout based on whatever format that you have for the workout. Yeah. And, and, Okay, so we have our movements, and that's pretty common. Uh, you know, like you said, I think a lot of us have, you know, put more importance on certain things, or maybe we don't include one or we call something else, uh, something else, right? Um, right. But, uh, you know, where do we go from there? What is now, because obviously, you know, we do have different people in our groups, different, you know, in our, with our athletes, et cetera. And I know, you know, at College of the Canyons, I mean, geez, I, I was there. I saw, I don't even know if it was 80 or 70 or 80 guys <laughs> lifting. Uh-huh. So what are some considerations for you that you're going to take in when you're thinking about, you know, designing that program? For, for us, it comes down to a couple of things. I think for most people, time is the biggest factor. It's the availability of time. So a, a lot of our teams, we only meet twice a week, and that's year-round. And then some will meet, you know, three times a week in the off-seasons, Twice a week in the end season. Football is really the only one that we've ever gone with a four day. We've had the luxury of having them four days a week. Um, and I'm okay with, I mean, it, I do different things with them. So it's not like I say, I, I wish my softball girls had four days a week. I don't, I, I think I can get plenty done in two or even three. But the considerations obviously within that now is how many days a week do I have? How much, how many minutes do I have? How much time do I have in that block? And then when I'm choosing the, exercises is for us for 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 my population i think for most populations but for mine especially is i need to get them familiar and um getting performing exercise as well so so i can't you know a lot of times for certain groups are a little more advanced or i've got a whole group of returning stops on this volleyball team and they're really good at all these different olympic lift variations we'll use a ton of them but if it's a new group we might be doing just a lot of clean pulls or a lot of jump shrugs or maybe some hand cleans, but we probably won't be doing the same amount of variation. Same with, you know, if I'm really trying to get them to front squat, well, we're going to, we're going to be focusing on front squat quite a bit. We're going to be doing that quite a bit. And then we'll be mixing in our unilateral work on a, on the opposite days. But the whole thing is I just kind of look at the time constraints that I have, you know, how much time I have with them, how many times a week do I have with them? And then within that workout, what's going to be the best choice of exercises for that group that are going to help them reach their goal. But at the same time, exercises where they can load when we need to load, um, where they can, you know, progress, you know, like we would like to, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, okay. We'll get to the templates for two, two to three day or a four day. Uh, cause I know they're definitely different. And, and with your, uh, with your categories, that's obviously, that's why the categories are important. So then you could recreate your templates, but mm-hmm. let's first talk about warm ups because, I think, you know, there's so, I, you know, I've had trainers in here kind of renting from me and I, I you know, I'll go out to places or I'll talk, obviously talk to people about stuff. And I think the warm up ends up being a philosophy. Like, for example, with me, I like to think of, you know, it's a, a you know, I have a more of an educated warm up where we're, we're looking at activation and we're, we're, we're looking at mobility first. So we're just kind of following the path of childhood development. And, and by saying that, I can tell people, okay, we're going to start with mobility first and then we're going to get you on your back and turn you over on your stomach into crawling and then into, you know, some, uh, some, some, ha- some, some uh, split stance into lunging into locomotion. That's my warm up idea, philosophy. Can you mm-hmm. talk to us about how you want to prepare people in general for those workouts? What is your philosophy? For for us, um, strategically in our in our place, you've seen it. We did the strength coach TV deal. Remember that where we walked? You actually saw that chaos that was the yeah. football team, and then we then we cleared them out, and then 
we got to walk through the room and you kind of saw we have more or less an entrance room. And in that room is kind of where we kind of did, I guess, I, I call it like the poor man's activation series. So it was basically we come in there and we foam roll. Um, we might do a little more stuff with a tennis ball or cross ball, but we're going to foam roll. Uh, they go through that sequence. We'd go through um, some mini band walks, you know, just kind of lateral shuffles, some monster walks, some hip bridges, you know, with the band around the knees. Then we'll go into more or less the warm up, which is basically we use a Turkish get up to kind of activate everything. I always tell the kids, like, turning the light switch on to every mover that we have. And it's just a real simple set of two with a moderate weight, nothing crazy. And then we go into like a kettlebell complex. Now, <clears throat> what I what I prefer to do if I have smaller groups or one on ones now and things like that is take them through a more dynamic, almost almost like a movement prep warm up. It, it's not it's nothing crazy, but I, I like to do this. So this is kind of you know another change, I guess you'd say, because I've been constantly evolving. You know, even doing this twenty whatever years, you kind of want to kind of keep say, saying what might work better. So now I kind of try to front load a little bit more. So <clears throat> prior to that, what I just talked about doing in that room, we would go through more or less a dynamic warm-up. And it's just your, you know, your A skips, your backward skips, your lateral skips, some crawling patterns, knee tucks, single leg RDL walks, uh, you know, open doors, kind of open the hips up, um, karaoke, stuff like that. And then we'll go into it. So I, I feel like they're a little more ready to, 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 to light up the glutes with the bands and to put a little weight on the kettlebell and, and do the TGU. So that's kind of the sequence we like to go. And I also like to do a little bit of ladder work to kind of get everything lit up before they start to lift. So, I mean, it's just literally like two or three minutes on the ladder, just pick a couple of different patterns and go. So that's kind of where uh, we are now in terms of the warm up and how I would take any group through, you know, and go through um, uh, that whole sequence. And that's kind of like actually – I started really incorporating that when I started uh, working with Sean with the with the Ducks during the playoffs, and I had the Black Aces, so I had the prospects up, and that's how we kind of set everything up, and that's where I started saying, "Man, this is really the way to go." Uh, you know, and it was a smaller group, but it was you know about twelve or thirteen guys, but it was that was the pattern: dynamic warm up, kind of get them going, all these different movements, different planes of movement, backwards, forwards, some quick ladder work, get in the way, get in there, get your mini bands done. Get your uh, your rolling done. Get your 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 pre warm up done with the kettlebell complex. Oh, and then the kettlebell complex was real simple. It's just basically moderate kettlebell, five reps of each. Um, we do a goblet squat, Romanian deadlift, swings, and then go to the ground and go five judo push ups. And that's really um, gets them going. Now they get into their first lift, which is usually going to be like an Olympic lift variation. Let's expand on that because I mean. In the program that I was watching, you were just kind of talking about the templates for the two or three day and a four day. And I think, you know, this is something that we've we've gotten a lot of questions on, you know, with the four day because um, and it's coming from a lot of college guys who are trying to balance that, you know, CNS uh, intensive workout where, you know, you're going for four days and you're not, tr you're trying to make sure you're not frying anybody, but talk to us about your, how you're going to structure those two and three day and then the four day workout. For, <clears throat> for us, the two and three days is just kind of that modified full body. So it's a full body, but we're not going to hit every single movement you could, but it, it would end up being a really, really long workout. So for us, a good session would, would be, would take about anywhere from depending on the size of the group 35 to 40 minutes total that's coming in with the activation and all that stuff and then doing the workout giving me some time at the end to do some other things and maybe work on some deceleration drills or maybe a little more ladder work or maybe some strongman stuff or some conditioning so basically pretty simple uh, the 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 sequence that we we'll use for like this full body and it's it, whether it's a two day or a three day an a and b workout and if it's a three day, we would go A, B, A, and the next week go B, A, B. So we would just rotate through that. Or the third day do, you know, depending on where we are, what cycle we're in, we might do more of like a density kind of circuit or a more of a metabolic circuit, whatever our needs would be with that team. So going into the workout, we would go with a, an explosive lift and we try set everything. So we would go an explosive lift paired with core. Try and then that try, sorry, try set it with core and with the prehab movement um, for our overhead athletes. So, our throwers, swimmers, volleyball, anybody with an, any kind of shoulder issue in the past. And that's just something simple like dumbbell Cuban presses or a letter sequence on the TRX. But they would go through those three 
and they would go through those three three all of our sets and then they'd move to the next tri set. So everything is a tri set and it's really, really efficient and we're always doing something and we're and but we're not uh sacrificing, you know, our, our we're not fatiguing ourselves to the point where we're trying to run through a circuit. We're, there's a there's a pace that we're going at. But we know, you know, if we're doing heavy hand cleans, that we need to be recovered to come back to that next set of heavy hand cleans. So, we like pairing it with core and with the prehab because we think it allows us to really push on that explosive lift. Then the next tri set would be that knee dominant and you know a squatting, lunging, stepping pattern. Uh, we do a pulling exercise and then a mobility, and that's one of the things we've added a few years ago was to try to put some mobility work inside the workout itself and get the athletes really. You know, it's almost lends lends more importance to it when they see, hey, we're doing it every day. We're doing, you know, squat to stand sequence or active straight leg raises or what I call triangles and kind of working in that frontal plane. We'll pair those, we'll tri set those three. And then the last tri set would be the hip dominant, which would be like your hinging or your, <clears throat> you know, glute ham raises or shelks with a pushing exercise, which could be either vertical or horizontal, and then another mobility. So that's it. That's the entire workout. And then if we flip that to the next time, we do the same thing with our core. The core would shift from the emphasis, like I said, those little the two emphasis that we have, either a rotational, anti-rotation, or like that pillar, anti-extension. Whatever we did last time, we'd flip it to the other one. Uh, we just have a different variation of Olympic lift. When we get to the knee, probably go to a unilateral. If we did a squatting pattern, like a front squat, we'd go to a unilateral pattern. On the next time, if we vertically pulled we would horizontally pull this time and then and then same thing on the hip we try to do a unilateral if we can if it was appropriate if we did a bilateral last time and then the push the same thing if we did a push press last time we would do a horizontal pushing trx uh, push up or bench press movement or something and then and then in mobility so it's really pretty simple and the templates are <laughs> cool and i mean part of the the best part i think of the entire program is we've really done a great job with developing an entire new set of workout cards which are almost i don't, I don't want to say dummy proof but they're almost dummy proof so it's really really hard because you're, you're never going to neglect something because you're going to click on it and you're going to have to pick an exercise according to that template so you, you you really it's really hard now you could pick the same exercise over and over which is what we don't really want to do we want to kind of mix things up but that would be the the, the dummy proof part that might not work but you know, some people get in a groove and they want to do something over and over again. I could see that from a learning, teaching perspective, but we want to make sure we're, we are thinking unilateral, bilateral. We are vertically, horizontally pushing and pulling. So hopefully that makes sense, but it's really you just plug it in um, and, and, and drag it, you know, drag it into the, into the menu. So that's, for me, that's the best part of the program in general is that, you know, even with power trading, people were asking about cards and we tried to make kind of a primitive set of cards but we had a hard time with it working across all platforms. It wasn't working well on Mac. You had to have an office, you know, office in you know, Excel. So it wasn't this one's this one's great because it's going to work on on any platform that you can basically pull it up on. Very cool. Well, what about the four day kind of balancing that? Because the four day <clears throat> just seems like I know the complaint that people had with the four day was okay. Yeah, knee dominant one day, hip dominant the other, knee dominant day three, hip dominant day four, whatever. And so your legs are getting a ton of work, especially if you're doing some conditioning, uh, which I want you to go into after you answer that question is like, where does the conditioning fit in as well? Yeah, you know, I think the important thing to remember is that. <clears throat> You got four days, but you're essentially doing, with the exception of, you know, you get to do core four days instead of two. You get to do explosive exercises four days in, uh, instead of two. But you are, say, squatting, you know, uh, you know, doing a knee dominant exercise twice a week and a hip dominant exercise twice a week. So it's not like we're, it's not that big of a, of a change in terms of volume or, or intensity or load. So, um, for us, it, it enables with football, especially enables us to take a large group and the temp, it's basically a pushing day and a pulling day. So an explosive, and I know on a pushing day, it's a harder day, right? That's a day we're going to probably do push presses and we're going to squat. So the Olympic lift is going to have to be, or the explosive exercise is going to have to take that in consideration. So it's not going to be my heavy clean day. It's probably going to be more of a snatch day or muscle snatches or dumbbell snatches, uh, or even just a, an unloaded jumping exercise or band jumps. So on that day, we'd have a, explosive exercise and we'd pair it with core 
if we had a prehab situation, we're usually doing that at the end. If it's a group that's doing it at the end, for them, it's quarterbacks and anybody with shoulder issues. We're doing something at the end of the workout or at the beginning of the workout. So it's not part of the workout. So it's explosive and core. Then we're going to take like a, a horizontal push um, and we're going to pair it with uh, with the hit, with the, uh, sorry, with the, um, a knee dominant exercise. So we might take, we might take our front squats and pair them with uh, push presses. And then we'd have one more push, which would be like a horizontal push. And we pair that with a mobility just so we all have even pairs. So we, we're always making sure that mobility is in that, in that mix, but that's it. So you can see it's significantly less uh, exercises that you're doing in that day. Granted, you're doing it four days, but the workout, the sessions are shorter. But the teams that the only team that we have doing a four-day is football. And because there's such a huge group, it does take a little longer to get through that workout. But if that was my volleyball group or my basketball group, they would get done with that workout in like 20 minutes. You know, So it's not like – you're not – it's not four days of what I explained that first template to be for sure. Like I even think three days with that first template might be kind of pushing it a little bit depending on the group and the training history with that group and things like that. So um, that's kind of the push. And then the next day the pull would be you know explosive with core again. We would have our hip dominant uh, movement with a, some kind of a, either a vertical or a horizontal pull. And then whatever we didn't, you know, didn't do there or say we did a pull up uh, with a kettlebell swing – we might go with uh, a, a TRX row with a mobility. So we, we, we would make sure we're getting everything in, uh, make sure we're alternating. You know, like I said, you still got the considerations of bilateral, unilateral. You still got your considerations of planes of movement, making sure you're changing that up. Even simply going from a chin to a wide grip pull up would be kind of changing planes of movement. So uh, we want to make sure we're thinking about all those types of things as well. Now, with football, we have other things, right? So, football, we also have things like neck work. Um, that we want to get in, but that's usually we do it as a group, um, you know, at the beginning or the end. And then you were asking about conditioning, like where does that fit? And it's just going to depend on where we are um, in, this, in, in the year. So <clears throat> usually we would get that done in the summertime. You know, we train in the morning. We get our lift done. We get out in the field. We get our conditioning done, uh, depending on what the emphasis is going to be, whether it's a little more – you know, like the gas and stuff or a little more, you know, going a little longer, doing some half gassers or some one tens, they would get a, about a 15 minute break and then they'd go to practice. We try to do our conditioning before practices, uh, with football. Uh, it's almost just a psychological thing for them. So they might be a little worn, but they tend to recover during, pra- during the, the practice where, you know, versus like, you know, they're in team period. Now they're waiting to see me from when I'm coming down the stairs and they're what's those got lined up for me today. And then, and then they end up uh, you know, wasting, you know, wasting practice time with these guys not being focused. So we found that to be a really effective way uh, to get that done. Um, and then uh, in the off season, we're not doing a lot of actual like energy system stuff, but we, after the weight room, we would go out and do our speed work or our reactive work or explosive work or strongman stuff. And that would obviously all, you know, put, you know, uh, all go in that whole conditioning pie as well, I guess. Coach, I want you to go over your periodization story because I think, um, you know, we've had you on a couple times and we've, we <clears throat> like, and it's been a while, but, you know, we've talked about sometimes <clears throat> people feeling like we're not working these kids hard enough. Um, you know, and you, you know, that's always been your big thing, even in your manual and this product you're talking about. It's always kind of been your thing, work capacity, and your saying has always been do work, you know. Um, so talk to us about your periodization story and how you've got into alternating linear cycles. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, we work really hard. So we, we do get in there, we grind and everything else. But I think the story that I always talk about is we won a national championship in 2004 and that was probably the most brutal, grueling training that these kids have ever had. And it was one of those things where we just had a, you know, a really tough camp. We lifted all through camp. We conditioned more than anybody. We just, the conditioning thing's always big for me in any sport because I think it's the one thing, the only one thing that you have complete control over with any of your teams is your ability to be conditioned. They could you could play teams that are bigger, faster, stronger, more talented, but you can 
hang your hat on that if you choose to. You could say, I'm going to be the most well-conditioned team in this whole conference or, you know, in the country. And you could do it. It's really easy. You just got to condition. <laughs> so, and anybody can condition. It's not like, you know, this guy, this kid's got to get five inches taller or drop five, you know, half a second on his 40. It's not like that. It's We can all get conditioned. So that's what I've always hung my head on. That's what goes back to the work capacity thing. We just try to turn the knob a little bit every day and get people to be able to put in more work. And by putting in more work, obviously, we're going to be able to get stronger and faster and bigger and all that good stuff. So um, I think the, the change for me was when I reflected back, and it was, <clears throat> it was Al Vermeil that, uh, that asked the question, and I didn't know Al at the time. He asked, you know, after I laid out this whole beautiful program, and it was this, you know, cr- crazy three-month, God, almost a four-month process of in season, you know, the old school maintenance in the linear scheme of our kids doing 85, 90, 95 percent one RM stuff. And I was complexing stuff going from squats to box jumps and and then coupling that, you know, with really hard practices, really hard running, you know, conditioning and a really tough schedule. And um, we ran the table and even got to the playoffs and we had virtually no injuries the whole year. And, you know, um, going to the playoffs, we throw two shutouts in Southern California. Junior college football is better than anything in the whole country. It's just, it's so competitive and it's so vicious out here <clears throat> that we, you know, you know, it's like my creatures are better than your creatures this year. Period. That's 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 kind of how that's what we that's what our saying was. That's what our motto was. So we went in and we ran the table and we won the national championship and beat San Francisco City. <clears throat> so I laid out this program, and at the very end, Al came up to me and said, "Hey, Joseph, I really like that." Uh, did you ever at any point think you were overtraining your guys? And in my mind, I was like, well, you know, and justifies the means. Like, what do you mean? Like, our guys were healthy. You know, we didn't have any injuries. Everybody was thriving. We had a great time. We ran the table. But then my thought was, if he asked me the question, I should probably ponder that for a minute at least, right? Even if, even if just to reflect on it. And then I started looking at the workouts, and I was like, how did I not – how did these guys make it through this? I was looking at the running that we did, you know, Monday through Wednesday. I was looking at the schedule that they had. I was looking at the competition and knowing how hard our practices were with our football coaches themselves. Knowing they, you know, these kids, we don't, we can't give them nutrition. We don't have any training table. We don't have any supplements to give them. You know, you know, they're not sleeping enough. Like, and I think at that point, I realized that maybe I was just really lucky that year that I didn't break some people down. That we didn't get some freak hamstrings or some freak injuries, you know, from from overtraining. So. In spite of something not being broke, I, I made a complete change. So, <clears throat> you know, based in 2004, so 11, 11, 12 years ago, we made that shift from having a traditional linear scheme, which was like your off-season phase with your hypertrophy phase, your strength phase, and your peaking phase, and then your preseason with your hypertrophy, your strength, and, and then the, your in-season with this crazy maintenance, and then a post, you know, post-season active recovery model. So instead of doing that, which I did for – Years and years and years, we went to this alternating linear, which was basically every three weeks, I don't care where we are in the summer or the fall or the spring or the winter, we're going to change our emphasis every three weeks from our hypertrophy set of you know loading to a strength power uh, phase, kind of three weeks. So, And we could change it to two weeks. If it's a summertime, I have an eight-week block. We're going to do it every two weeks. But say right now during the season – They'd be going. So if it's their, you know, soccer's going, they're in a hypertrophy phase. They're in it. If the end of the season it works out that they're in playoffs and we start a hypertrophy phase, we just do it. Like it, nothing's. We haven't seen anything but positives with this. We've seen uh, really fresh legs. We've seen people pring in their lifts, you know, in the last cycle that we go through and get to our our strength or power phase. I'm seeing our kids get prs on their squats, on their jerks, on their cleans you know all these things so i know i kind of feel like i i I get to recharge them every three weeks we get to recharge them a little bit kind of change that emphasis and fight the boredom perhaps and and fight that stagnation that we normally that we would get from a long in season especially or even a long hypertrophy phase of six or seven weeks it's a long time to be in it and then the, the main consideration was and i've talked you know, you know, with Alan Cosgrove over about this years ago is, you know, when you're in those phases, like think about that, you know, I, I, you're away from hypertrophy for, th- for almost four months and we know hypertrophy is important. So how would we be okay with, you know, dumping that for four months? And same thing if I'm in a six or seven week hypertrophy phase in the off season, by the time I get to the end of that hypertrophy phase, it's been almost two months since I've done any strength, power, 
type loading. So for us, we, we kind of feel like it's a it's a great model because it it, it it keeps us honest and we know there's going to be a shift there. We know we get to change change our weights. And, and for us, it, it also makes sense to select specific types of exercises. Like for things like hex bar deadlifts, it really fits in better when we get to that lower volume instead of me going, okay, guys, we got three sets of 10 on the, on, on the hex bar deads today. It's just those are the exercises that for us, you know, I, I'd rather pick something else uh, to fit in that rep scheme that would that would be a little more suitable, I guess. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, one of those things is, you know, when we look at what's happening today, too, with uh, all the monitoring, and we've kind of certainly talked a lot about that in the last three episodes, um, people really trying to figure out, you know, when when is the best time to kind of load and not load and you know even not you know from a micro cycle like during the week and you know what day because games fall on different days so it's interesting to kind of have you with you know working through all this time and Mm -hmm. not only considering like a lot of people just can say hey we won the national championship we're not changing a damn thing you know right (laughs) right and and even in hindsight now if i look back at that team and those men that I'm good friends with the majority of them now, I know that I could do stuff to them that there's no way I could have done to our, you know, near national championship team in 2008. There were different types of kids. And now even the kids now that we have, some of them would really take to that, but a lot of them wouldn't. It just was a, it was a unique group. It was like the perfect storm. And I think in hindsight, I probably got a little bit lucky on that. Um, You know, and, and you're also, I'm also talking about that 19, 20, 21 year old animal. Yeah. Who can who can get away with that stuff and still be jacked, ripped, eating you know Cheetos and Top Ramen? So it, <laughs> it's it you know with no supplements at all. Um, but and we no also sleep. see and no, sleep. no sleep. But we see when they go get that big time D one ride, and then the next time they come back for for Christmas break, and you're like, holy moly, what happened to you? You know, they're like they look like different guys. That all of a sudden they're getting all these sups and they're getting food as much as they need to, and they're. They've got all this different, you know, this time to do stuff, and it's man, you know, they change, they completely change. So, you know, I always say, if I could feed my athletes just one, me- just breakfast every day, every record would be broken on that board. There's no way any of those records would still be there, and we'd have a lot of different looking animals for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, um, Coach. Let's finish up. I'm gonna have a link for everybody to get your product. Um, to get this program design product, which is really good. Obviously, uh, I wouldn't have you on if I didn't think it was. Um, your stuff's always been great. Tell us a little bit about the product uh, as we finish up here. Basically, it's all the stuff we kind of talked about. It's it, it's got a the 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 time consuming part for us was <clears throat> getting out. You know, I flew out to Will Fleming's place out in in Bloomington, and <clears throat> we shot all of the exercises. Now. Even then, you know, it's probably not all the exercises. It's, it's, a, it's a majority of our exercises, kind of our go-to exercises. So it's got a really extensive video library that you can refer back to. And that, that's how I'm using it. It's more of a reference for you to, to dial in some cueing to see some fundamentals of that exercise. Because sometimes you might find something there, even, you know, from the foam rolling to the mini band stuff to <clears throat> TGUs or our core work. Everything's in there. So it's, it's, it's like eight. DVD, so it's a ton of stuff in there, and then the manual kind of gives the background behind that, and then within the DVDs, obviously, like you said, <clears throat> you know, we have the actual webinar that that kind of explains that, and that's what I would tell people to watch and kind of sit down and take the time to do that, or at least uh, download the MP3 that's on there as well, and just put it on your on your phone and listen to it as you drive or something. Just kind of give yourself that background. That's I enjoy doing that. Actually, that's what I always do with all the DVDs I get now that have that option with the mp3 is i put it on my phone right away and then i just listen to it if i'm flying or i'm driving or something so i think that's a great way for me i, I kind of soak that in a lot better sometimes than watching that on my computer but so we got that there's like also a couple of big bonuses in there a couple more webinars with the chaos stuff and the alternative training tools but like i said the workout cards <clears throat> are, are are downloadable and they're on one of the discs in there as well and this whole thing comes in a digital format too i don't know if that's the one you got or you got the hard copy but um, the digital format you'll get if you even if you get the hard copy you'll have the option to get that, but you can download the cards and you can be using those right away and I think that's the, that's that's a huge bonus part of that. Uh, uh, it's a huge, it's it is a, a one of the big factors in that program for sure because it enables you too. And then the cool thing about the cards is 
you can uh, add your own exercises, uh, you can delete exercises. So it's, you, you're going to have a lot of uh, freedom with that with that whole plug and play system. So now you can kind of play around and and put your own stuff in there as well, which we couldn't do with kind of the, the older versions of our cards that we tried to make. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's the complete program. So uh, talks about all the templates, including the density stuff, including the metabolic circuits, how you would format those. Uh, and then in the cards, you can format them right there. And then um, I think the video library is going to be unmatched. I don't think there's anything like that. We spent a lot of time uh, and that's something that Pat, Pat Beath really wanted to have it set apart from everything else. And that's why we really brought in an amazing production crew to do that. You know, I'm usually doing stuff on my iPhone or my GoPro, in my garage. And these, I mean, these are pro guys, the pixel mob guys that, that did, you know, Lee Taft stuff and Will Fleming's <clears throat> product. It's just, it's spectacular stuff. Just, just great, great footage. So, um, that's a big part of the program, obviously. But like I said, it's kind of like, You've got this program, and I always say it's it's a science. There's no doubt. There's a science, and there's a lot of rules to follow, but you've got a lot of leeway in it. Um, it's not rocket science, and be, having having it be a plug and play. I think I think people really gravitate to that when they see that concept of just like, oh, I get it. These are my movement patterns. These are my options now within those movement patterns. Oh, how about this exercise? I could add this one. They, you're free to add it. You're free to I don't like to teach Olympic lift and don't ever do them. There's a whole other list of things you can do to address, you know, triple quadruple extension. So we, we feel like it's people are going to dig it just because, <clears throat> you know, it gives them so many options, so many choices. And it simplifies something. I think that sometimes we see, especially nowadays, people try to get a little too sexy with, I think, and then it turns people off or it's just ineffective because it's just never, you know, it's never worked. This is stuff that we've done. It's been effective for, everything you know i was just writing some stuff for a couple of people to help uh kind of explain this program and then i was like you know this is this is this is my lab you know this is my real this is my research lab and, and these are my subjects you know two to 250 to 320 every day for at, at this college for 17 years i mean there's there's a lot of things that we've done that worked a lot of things that we've done that didn't work that we've tweaked and this is kind of like the the culmination of all that, you know, trial and error and everything else. And I think it's, it's, it, it builds on power training. It builds on cardio strength training as well a little bit. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, like I say, I like to almost call it power training 2.0 because the philosophy and the foundation, the bedrock is the same. It's just that we've changed a little bit of the formatting. We've obviously got that mobility component, which I think is very important. And I think, um, it's just become an effective sequence, you know, and then with this, obviously we've added some exercises, we've added some tools that we didn't have power training, like a lot more TRX, a lot more ultimate sandbag, um, kettlebell moves, things like that. So yeah, it's kind of like 2015, you know, we're trying to simplify things, but at the same time, get the most effective and efficient, uh, product or program out there. Absolutely. Well, it looks great. And I'm going to have a link on my site for the release so everyone can, you know, get that uh, that discount right away. It's going to be coming out on September 8th. So uh, we'll have this podcast up before that, but uh, everyone will have an opportunity to get that discounted price. So, Coach, thanks so much for coming on today and kind of going over all the program design stuff. Uh, like my favorite saying, you're you know you're you're in, you're involved in that, uh, been there, done that, still doing it, and uh, still doing it really well. So, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right, that's going to do it for episode 171 of the Train Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Poyer, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Coach Dose for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, and performance enhancement. Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Brett Jones and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Stefan Underwood for his insights into the art of coaching with Exos. Check them out at teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. And remember, you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for just $1. Three days, just a buck. Once your three-day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. 
depending on how many people you got. To access your trial, go to shrinkcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on that trial. My name is Anthony Renner, and you can reach me at shrinkcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.